Hello again everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at some of the Flat Earthers claims about airplanes. I'm reading from The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe. Ooh, did you hear that? Proof. There's going to be proof this time. By Edward Hendry. Chapter 5. Airplane Level Flight Proves the Earth is Flat. An airplane maintaining a constant altitude somehow proves the Earth is flat. Okay, this should be interesting. If the Earth were a globe, airliners would not be able to fly on a flat and level path. Wait, wait, what was that? Did you say flat and level? Flat and level are not the same thing. Flat is flat. Level is at an equal distance from the center of gravity. Any pilot will tell you that once a plane gets to its cruising altitude, the pilot, quote, levels off, close quote, and flies in a straight and level path. Straight and level flight is pretty much what the name implies. It's flight in which constant heading and altitude are maintained. That's it. Indeed, the pilot uses the horizon to ensure that the plane is flying level. When visibility is poor, the pilot will use the instruments and fly a level heading using an artificial horizon. Okay, basically accurate. What's your point? Either way, at all times, the plane flies level once the pilot reaches cruising altitude. If the Earth were a globe, the pilot would have to constantly adjust the heading of the plane and dip its nose down to keep a constant altitude. Okay, well that's wrong in more than one way. What was just said implies that the only way to decrease altitude would be to pitch the nose of the plane downward. In reality, the plane's altitude is determined exclusively by how much lift is available to overcome the downward force that is applied by gravity. The amount of lift can be altered not only by changing the angle of attack of the wing, by raising or lowering the nose of the plane, but also by altering forward air speed. Another thing wrong is the flat earther implication that if the plane did not make these downward adjustments, it would fly off into space. This is plainly ridiculous. By maintaining a constant amount of lift, counteracting gravity, the airplane is already moving in a circular path over the surface of the planet at a constant altitude. However, the earth is in fact Flat. So if a pilot dipped the nose of the plane down to adjust for the supposed curvature of the Earth, he would find that he is losing altitude. Yes, if a pilot tried to adjust for something you do not need to adjust for, in this case he would lose altitude. If the pilot kept on that downward trajectory, the plane would crash into the earth. Agreed. Already stated. That's why we maintain a constant altitude so that we continue in our circular path around the surface of the earth, maintaining a constant distance from the surface of the earth. Can I make this any clearer? The fact that no such downward adjustment is made by pilots for the supposed curvature of the Earth is proof that the Earth is flat. No, it isn't. Perhaps you should take another look at my diagram. Constant lift provides constant altitude above the surface of the Earth, which provides a curved path around the Earth. No adjustments necessary. Give me some credit here. It's kind of hard to draw with no thumbs. Eric Dubay explains. Ah, shit. 
If the Earth were a sphere, airplane pilots would have to constantly correct their altitudes downward so as to not fly straight off into, quote, outer space, close quote. This is just more repetition of what you've already said, and concurrently, another reason we call Eric Dubé an idiot. Do you need to see the diagram again? If the Earth were truly a sphere, 25,000 miles circumference, curvetting 8 inches per mile squared. 8 inches per mile squared is only an approximation and grows increasingly inaccurate as distance increases. A pilot wishing to simply maintain their altitude at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles per hour would have to constantly dip their nose downwards and descend 2,000 777 feet over half a mile every minute. No, we would not have, and the diagram they've provided here proves that. In this diagram, you can plainly see the plane maintaining a constant altitude. This is achieved by a constant amount of lift being applied against gravity. Any changes in the amount of lift would not have the effect of following the Earth's curve. They would either increase or decrease the amount of lift and therefore increase or decrease the altitude. If they wanted to say that it was necessary for the pilot to change the plane's altitude, they should not have given us a picture that shows the plane maintaining a constant altitude. Just a thought. Otherwise, without compensation, in one hour's time, the pilot would find themselves 166,666 feet, that's 31.5 miles, higher than expected. So the assertion is the plane is going to gain altitude without any additional lift. Well, that's just wrong. If you do not increase lift, by either increasing the angle of attack or increasing airspeed, you do not ascend. You do not gain altitude merely by maintaining the same amount of lift. Remember this little diagram from before. A plane flying at a typical 35,000 feet, wishing to maintain that altitude at the upper rim of the so-called troposphere in one hour would find themselves over 200,000 feet high into the mesosphere with a steadily raising trajectory the longer they go. This is just repetition and just as wrong as it was before. No increase in lift, no increase in altitude. That's how it works. I have talked to several pilots and no such compensation for the Earth's supposed curvature is ever made. That's because no such compensation is needed for reasons already explained more than once. When pilots set an altitude, their artificial horizon gauge remains level, and so does their course. Nothing like the necessary 2,777 foot per minute declination is ever taken into consideration. There's going to be nothing but repetition for the rest of this video. It's already been explained that you need to maintain a constant altitude in order to continue over the surface of the Earth. You don't need to descend. If you descend, you have not maintained a constant altitude. And again, you'll notice they're giving us a diagram that shows that. Indeed, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, assumes a flat Earth when training pilots and air traffic controllers using their Target Generation Facility, TGF. The TGF consists 
of several software programs that control simulation scenarios using simulated aircraft. The TGF computer simulator drives almost all of the air traffic control laboratories at the FAA William J. Hughes Technical Center. The FAA states, quote, Our lab has worked closely with the TGF group to have aircraft perform the way air traffic controllers would expect them to behave in the real National Aerospace System, NAS. The simulated aircraft in TGF are quite realistic representations of their real-life counterparts. Close quote. The software used in the TGF must be accurate in order to properly train pilots and air traffic controllers on the behavior of aircraft in flight. The assumption of a flat earth can be seen in a publication from the FAA. The engineering analysis and design of the aircraft dynamics model for the FAA Target Generation Facility, TGF. That FAA publication explains the software that is used by the TGF to accurately simulate the behavior of aircraft over the Earth. Specifically, this document discusses the detailed engineering design and software implementation of an aircraft dynamics model, ADM, suitable for incorporation into the FAA TGF simulations at the FAA William J. Hughes Technical Center, Atlantic City, New Jersey. The model is designed to be implemented on computers located within the facility and to work in conjunction with software models of radar, data links, and other air traffic management ATM equipment to provide real-time simulation of aircraft operating within the National Aerospace System, NAS. The FAA publication explains that in order for the software to accurately replicate the behavior of aircraft during flight over the Earth, the software running the TGF simulator assumes that the Earth is flat. Why, you may ask, did I allow him to blather on so long? Well, there was a reason for that. I needed to demonstrate the basic dishonesty of the Flat Earther. This tactic tends to use a series of verifiable truths that do not necessarily point to their desired conclusion, and exclude many inconvenient truths that point away from their preferred conclusion. The mention of flat earth modeling in this system is used to refer to inertial reference frames. It is a simplification that allows the program to work. What is excluded in the flat earther's explanation is that the FAA also mentions what this reference frame can and cannot be used for. One example of what it cannot be used for is trajectory propagation. Ooh, and guess what? My assertions come with citations. The information I just mentioned can be found in a document entitled The Engineering Analysis and Design of the Aircraft Dynamics Model for the FAA Target Generation Facility, specifically on page 32, paragraphs 2 and 3. The observant reader will notice that the aircraft equations of motion were calculated 
assuming a flat Earth, and that we here assume the development frame was the northeast down frame. This implies necessarily that the Earth rotation and the variation of the gravity vector with position over the Earth were ignored in developing the aircraft equations of motion. This simplification limits our mathematical model to the flight of aircraft only. The model will not properly handle the flight of suborbital craft and spacecraft such as intercontinental ballistic missiles, satellites, or the space shuttle. The model is adequate for all vehicles traveling under Mach 3. Notice that the FAA document both assumes a flat Earth and ignores the rotation of the Earth and gravity. The FAA maintains that the computer model assumes a stationary flat Earth and at the same time remains precise and accurate regarding the flight of aircraft. The only way that a stationary flat Earth can be the basis for a model and that model still be accurate is if the Earth is in fact flat and stationary. That means that the ignored gravity and rotating globular Earth do not affect the accuracy of the model because they do not, in fact, exist in reality. And blather, 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 and decided to skip right over the paragraph that starts, For trajectory propagation, since we cannot assume a flat Earth, the original inertial reference frame denoted with an I subscript is modified for the elliptic Earth. Wonder why a flat Earther would want to skip over that paragraph. Hmm, you don't suppose that implies dishonesty, do you? Since it was in the next paragraph, and it's not like they didn't see it. The proviso in the last sentence that the computer model does not address spacecraft or satellites is meaningless surplusage. The statement that the model is adequate for all vehicles traveling under Mach 3 is also meaningless, since it does not specify that it would be inaccurate for vehicles traveling over Mach 3. The entire purpose of the TGF simulation is to create as real a simulation of actual aircraft flight over the Earth as is possible. The only way to do that is to simulate what is real. That is why the TGF software assumes a flat Earth. The TGF is designed to have, quote, high fidelity, close quote, to reality. The FAA publication states, Currently, the Aircraft Dynamics Incorporated in the TGF are based on the first principles of physics and aeronautics. The models provide the performance characteristics needed to support high fidelity simulations. The TGF incorporates fuel burn models, environmental weather effects. Additionally, the modeled aircraft are representative of commercial air traffic in the U.S. national airspace.
NAS. As future simulations are developed or brought to the technical center, higher fidelity will be required to identify NAS operational safety and performance issues. The TGF is prepared to increase its fidelity and operational connectivity required to meet the demands by other FAA programs and simulators. And more reciting of actual truths that do not point to their preferred conclusion, in the hopes that if they throw enough true things at you, you will accept their unfounded conclusion. The goal of this project has been to develop and maintain a high fidelity simulation capability to meet the needs of the FAA in operating, testing, and evaluating its NAS. A little more truth thrown at you. The reality to which the TGF software is faithful is that the Earth is stationary and flat. If the TGF simulator based its model on the false premise of a globular spinning Earth, it would create a safety issue for aircraft. The FAA simply had to assume a flat Earth because that is reality. If the FAA had assumed a spinning spherical Earth model, the pilots and air traffic controllers would be trained improperly and create the messy and embarrassing result of planes crashing with regularity. None of what was just said was supported by the document in question. Indeed, since safety is paramount, it was necessary for the FAA to verify with real-life testing the algorithms in the TGA simulator that assume a flat stationary Earth. The FAA publication states that, quote, the document concludes with a section on verification and validation, the process by which the various features of the simulation are tested and verified, close quote. What did the section on verification reveal? The FAA publication reports that, quote, the testing that was done to verify and validate the TGF simulation gives us a high degree of confidence that the models contained herein have sufficient fidelity for their use as a target generating tool. The models that the testing validated as being faithful to reality to a high degree of confidence assumed a flat stationary Earth. That means that the FAA verified through actual testing with aircraft with a high degree of confidence that the Earth is flat and stationary. And again, we leave out the parts that are inconvenient. Page 235 of the same document, first paragraph, states, the tool used was pseudo control, the aircraft dynamics kernel of PAS, PAS, the NASA tool for trajectory generation. If you recall from the inconvenient paragraph they left out before, trajectory generation cannot use the flat earth model, but instead requires the elliptical model. The same document also makes references to planes tangential to the Earth's surface. A flat surface does not have a tangent. Are you seeing the dishonesty here? The U.S. government implicitly acknowledged the reality of the flat stationary Earth in another official publication. In NASA's 1988 publication, number 
1207 titled Derivation and Definition of a Linear Aircraft Model, it states that the generally accepted linear aircraft model is based upon, quote, a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth, close quote. The very next sentence starts, the derivation makes no assumptions of reference trajectory or vehicle symmetry. Remember reference trajectory before? Yeah, dishonesty. Every commercial and military aircraft has on board an instrument that can only work on a flat earth. Unfounded assertion. Let's see if the flat earther now tries to support it with true but unrelated facts. Wouldn't be out of character, would it? That instrument is the attitude indicator, which is also known as an artificial horizon. That artificial horizon instrument has a display that shows the pilot the attitude of the plane to the active horizon, even if he cannot see the horizon because it is obscured by inclement weather or darkness. The pilot can determine the role of the aircraft, i.e. if he is flying level, and the pitch of the aircraft, i.e. if the nose of the aircraft is pointed below or above the horizon. Okay, there are some truths thrown in. Let's see if these lead to some kind of conclusion. That attitude indicator works by means of a spinning gyroscope. Actually, I think most modern ones are a combination of an accelerometer and a magnetometer. If there are any avionics experts out there, Please, in the comments below, tell me if I'm mistaken. Mounted on a gimbal. A gyroscope has two important properties. One, rigidity in space, and two, precession. All practical applications of gyroscopes are based on these two properties. Precession means that the gyro will resist any force that attempts to change its plane of rotation. A force applied to the gyro will result in a movement of the gyro, but not in the direction of the applied force. The gyro will instead move at right angles to the direction of the applied force. The rate of precession is in direct proportion to the applied force. The most important property of a gyroscope for a pilot is rigidity in space. That means that the gyroscope will retain its horizontal attitude parallel to the direction of the spin of its rotor and retain its vertical attitude in relation to its rotor's axis. The rotor's axis around which it spins is the y-axis, vertical. The horizontal plane of the rotor is on the x, lateral axis, and the z, depth axis. Thus, if the spinning gyroscope is on a gimbal that allows for rotation along three axes, x, y, and z, the gyroscope will retain its original attitude in relation to the X, Y, Z axis and the gimbal will move around the fixed gyroscope. The X, Y, Z axes of the gyroscope will remain rigid in space, offering a fixed matrix upon which the airplane can move. Any difference between the fixed axes of the gyroscope and the moving airplane will show up 
in the coordinates on the attitude indicator instrument. That is what the gimbal attached to the aircraft in the instrument bay allows, as illustrated in the following frames from a U.S. Navy training film produced in the 1960s explaining how gyroscopic flight instruments work. The spinning gyroscope in the attitude indicator stays fixed and rigid in space. The gimbal in the attitude indicator instrument allows for the aircraft to move in relation to the fixed axes X, Y, and Z of the spinning gyroscope. Thus, the pilot can see by looking at the attitude indicator instrument the exact attitude of his plane in relation to the horizon. Great description of a gimbal gyroscope. But I find it odd that you failed to mention exactly how it's applied in modern avionics. I'm guessing you're about to botch that. Let's see. The problem with the spherical Earth model is that a plane with an attitude indicator showing straight and level flight will cause the plane to fly off into the upper atmosphere as the curve of the globe falls away from the aircraft. Ooh, what a surprise. He fails to mention the compensation made in modern avionics for the reported attitude change of the gyroscopes. The only way that a pilot on an aircraft can fly a straight and level path using his attitude indicator is on a flat earth. What he is obliquely referring to here is called transport wander. A gyroscope will attempt to maintain its original alignment with the earth. When an aircraft moves across the globe, uh, the local horizontal reference changes and this will create an angle with the gyro. This error is known as transport wander, also as apparent drift. What he doesn't mention is it's usually corrected by signals derived from the INS latitude and longitude. Below is a frame from a United States Navy training film, circa 1960. The frame illustrates the inherent impossibility of maintaining level flight for an aircraft using gyroscopic instruments. Using uncompensated gyroscopic instruments, you dishonest flat earther. On a spherical earth. The gyroscope depicted in the frame is seen to maintain its rigidity in space as it hypothetically circumnavigates the globe. As is obvious by the rigid attitude of the gyroscope, a plane with a gyroscopic attitude indicator would be gradually heading out toward the upper atmosphere as it traversed the globe. Yes, using the pictured gyroscope as the artificial horizon, uncompensated, yes, that would be the result. That's why they don't do that. Indeed, as indicated in the film illustration, the plane would be in a vertical trajectory after flying one quarter of the circumference of the Earth, a distance of approximately 6,250 miles. And did you give any thought to what the purpose of such a film would be? Could it be, perhaps, to demonstrate what one would expect to see from a gyroscope as one traversed the planet? so that one was aware of what kind of compensation was needed and why? You think maybe that's why they made the film? Incidentally, the training film narrator tried to explain away this apparent problem by stating that there is 
a continuous adjustment to the attitude of the gyroscope built into the attitude indicator instrument. However, the mythical on-the-fly adjustment to the gyroscope is impossible as such an adjustment would render the gyroscope useless. I don't know whether to call that an assertion without evidence or an outright lie. I'm leaning towards outright lie because there's sufficient evidence that compensation mechanisms have been included in uh, inertial navigation systems for quite some time. So yeah, I'm leaning towards a lie. Recall that the fundamental property of a gyroscope is that it maintains its rigidity in space. If the fundamental property of a gyroscope, rigidity, can be so easily altered, that means that rigidity is not truly a fundamental property of a gyroscope. The rigidity is not altered. The reported change in angle is compensated for. An adjustment to the fundamental characteristic of rigidity in space of the gyroscope, if it were possible, would defeat the whole reason to use the gyroscope. It would make no sense to use an instrument with a gimbaled gyroscope that would require an additional feature to neutralize the primary property of the gyroscope, rigidity. Straw man fallacy. There is no attempt to neutralize its primary property, merely to compensate for changes in the output the supposed neutralizing feature of the instrument would need to detect the precise curvature of the supposedly ball earth and maintain a true course over its surface. Now, it's a fairly simple calculation to determine the necessary angle of change and then apply that to the output of the uh, gyroscope. If it could do all of that, why add the complication of a gimbaled gyroscope? Because both a gyroscope and a method of compensation would be necessary to maintain accuracy. I think that's a pretty good reason. An attitude indicator with gimbaled gyroscope would only be a hindrance on a ball earth. Nope. I'd really like to not repeat myself this time. Rigidity in space is exactly the opposite of what is called for in an attitude indicator on a spherical Earth. In an attitude indicator, that statement is correct. However, we're not talking about an attitude indicator here. We're talking about the systems and mechanisms that provide the data to drive the attitude indicator. Note the subtle shift between the talk of gyroscopes and the talk of the attitude indicator. They're not the same item. A gyroscopic attitude indicator instrument is necessary on a flat earth, but that same instrument would be pointless and even dangerous on a spherical Earth. Well, it's too bad we don't have a flat Earth to test it on. However, an attitude indicator, as I've described it, is fairly handy on a spherical Earth. A gyroscopic attitude indicator keeps its attitude precisely perpendicular on its axis on a fixed plane to the spin of its rotor and perfectly level in relation to the surface of the Earth. I screwed up there, but a gyroscopic attitude indicator does not have an axis. The gyroscope does. Because the Earth 
is flat. The rigidity in space of a moving gyroscope that maintains its attitude is only useful in an attitude indicator on a flat Earth. Yeah, we know that that's your assertion, but we pretty much demonstrated why that's not the case, and you failed to provide any evidence why that is the case. A gyroscopic attitude indicator simply will not work on a globe. Maybe not, but either a manually or automatically compensated one will. Well, the remainder of the source video stops talking about the curvature of the Earth and starts talking about its uh, motionlessness. Uh, we'll save that for another video. And here's where I think all this flat Earth nonsense started. It's all because an invisible man in the sky said so.